Chasing Tales, Episode 34, A Walk to Remember. Welcome back to another exciting episode of your favorite YouTube radio drama, Chasing Tales. In this week's episode, Kevin has found a story for the show. Pink still languishes in starlight. Will Cyric win her over? Let's find out. Pink wakes and slides out of the small rustic bed. There is fresh water and a towel for her to clean up. She notices a rustling near her. There's a skinny boy looking up at her patiently. He's young, but seems more mature than his apparent years. He takes her hand and seats her. He then takes the bands off, cleaning them and her skin, checking for injury. <sighs> what is your name? Talon. What is yours? Pink. He said that's what you would say. Do you work for Cyric? Sort of. He sent me to look after you while you are here. I brought you some clean clothes and a nightdress for sleeping. Is there anything else I can do to make you feel more comfortable? Do I have to wear these heavy bands? Yeah, it's for his protection. Why? Am I a threat to him? Hmm, maybe. He hasn't decided. You'll want to change into this set of clothes after lunch. He'll want to spar with you. She held up the outfit and examined it as it unfolded. A pair of rough pleated pants and a tie on each side and a tunic. She nods. Speaking of food, would it be possible to get breakfast? Of course. As soon as we have you dressed, I will inform him. Pink has a hundred questions for this old man in a little boy's body. She reminds herself that he is Cyric's ally, not hers, so she stays silent. The boy sends her behind a screen with a nice dress. It's simple, but it reminds her of the dress and apron she used to wear at Brenna's. It seems so long ago since I wore this type of clothes. It takes me back to the beginning. Kevin sits, reading through Pink's account of the Brandish story. I was mortified when Brandish went to pieces. Sprex was always a bit heavy-handed, but this was too much. There are rules, after all. Cornelius was shady, even for an immortal, but to break his soul? I had to do something. I floated in a bubble near the boatswain. I'd commissioned the armored maiden through Sorrel just for this trip. The ivory mermaid figurehead pointed out into the sea her trident gleaming. What's our first stop? And how will ye find it? We're headed to the Linnet Islands. I managed to find a piece of his soul. It'll vibrate when we're headed the right way. She shows him a box with a mirrored shard. She gathers magic, and it slowly rises to point in the correct direction. He gets his bearings and turns the ship to catch the winds. Pink watches the crew mill about, doing their work. The largest island is their target. The linnets were supposed to be uninhabited, so it should be easy enough to find the next fragment. Pink and Cyrix sit eating. My boy makes a fine meal. Daddy does. How long has Talon been with you? As long as you've been with the orders, I think. Did he choose the shape, or is that some kind of prison? Cyrix levels his gaze at her. Enslavement isn't really useful to me. Pink raises her wrists to show the bands he placed there. These bands aren't keeping you here, and Talon chose to take that shape. He works for me only sometimes. He has another job he likes more. Pink gave up and dropped her heavy wrists on the table. So what would you like to do next? Let's go out and have a walk. I'd like to show you something. He looks her over and waves his hand. Her dress changes from gray to pale blue. I'd prefer the blue, I think. Shall we? Cyric opens the door and pulls her gently through with the hand on the small of her back. They emerge into a cobblestone road that runs off into the trees either way. A rustic wooden fence lines the far side of the lane. Trees whisper to each other, and birds sing. The air is refreshing and clean. An ox cart lumbers its way next to them. Cyric talks to the man for some time. He is relaxed, casual, and friendly, but his language changes to the man's language. They come to some conclusion that satisfies both, and the ox cart and the man roll away. You seem to be treated very normally for a god. 
Cyric smiles, his head down. He looks up and speaks again, back to his way of talking to her. It's how I wanted them, so that's how I made them. He extends his hand, they proceed again. Pink tries to do the math in her head. He puts his hand on her arm softly. With his other hand, he points into the sky. Sometimes less is more. Alt always was a bit too poetic. The casual way he threw God's name around as if they were friends surprised and unnerved her a little. They weren't even allowed to say it. This made her pause. Don't they fear you? It's more respect than fear. There is a difference, you know. I suppose. Do you know why you fear him? It isn't death. And it certainly isn't hell. Pink shrug. It's loneliness, disconnectedness, feeling like an imposter. But you already know that feeling, don't you? Now that is a bit personal. If I'm to tailor your experience to my advantage, nothing can be off the table. You, of course, could lie, but your type normally doesn't do that. Pink wrinkles her nose at your type. My type? What do you mean? Goody goods. Is that all you see? You may use great tactics and sometimes black, but your outcomes are always for good. Even when it doesn't benefit you. Hmm. Look, the town is up ahead. Ahead of them, a town unfolds through a heart-shaped arch of trees. <sighs> She laughed to herself at the whimsy of it. He looked at her covertly and smiled. The quaint little village with thatched roofs spread out around them as they walked. People stopped him to shake hands over some solution he had made for them. So much gratitude. Is all your system like this? No. This is just my favorite place. It's simple. People really value what they do here. Craftsmanship is the theme of this place. They don't advance beyond this point? No, they feel like this is a survival balance point. What about resources? They regenerate to balance their use. If they use more, there is more next cycle. If they waste it, there is less next cycle. Pink searches the shadows and nooks and crannies for the lost. Cyric catches her around the third time, and chuckles to himself. <laughs> no homeless, no orphans, no want. But how? Everyone has what they need. These people take care of each other. Their empathy and their selflessness is something that they choose to pursue. You would fit in here. You could fit in here. Look at this house. He points her attention to a small thatched house. As they approach the door, it opens on its own. Inside is a beautiful little cottage. There is a large room to one side with soft furniture and musical instruments mounted to the wall. Sheet music lays scattered on an ottoman in the center of the room. The fireplace at one end suddenly blazes to life. Go, look around. Pink does so. He waits quietly. In the villa, Otto and Sin scramble to get reconnected to Pink. In Haven, Aislinn stands in training, barely there, worried about how she's doing. This is the longest since they bonded that he hasn't had the comfort of her noise in his head. The silence feels almost painful. In his apartment, Kevin reads his notes and types furiously. Pink and Branish's men that survived. Stand near here on the beach, Linux's largest island. Pink floats in her bubble next to them. They stare at a cliff that has stairs roughly cut into them. Sorrel looks up at the climb. There's gotta be a better way. I'll go scout her out. One of the younger lads takes to the rock and climbs to the top. There's a house up here. Someone lives here. Just at that moment, the little group begins to hear laughing from the jungle around them. What is Cyric's game? Will Pink succumb to his way of thinking? Will the angels get Pink back? Stay tuned to the next episode of Chasing Tales, The Wall.